I'm going to move into the live demo. For today's demonstration, I'll be focusing primarily on desktop and web, because those are the easiest to show on a webinar. If there's interest, you know, again, put it into the chat or the questions of things you'd like to see in the future. We could do a separate webinar uh, focusing on some of the enterprise apps. If you wanted to see Salesforce or, or Oracle or um, Dynamics, if you wanted to see um, another, uh, uh, mobile, that's usually a separate demo because of the setup and we have to set up different environments to show all that. So we can show um, mobile as well. So again, let us know if there's any specific use cases that, you, that you'd like to see in a live application, but please contest all of those. Uh, but for today's demonstration, I'll be focusing on web and desktop just to give you a flavor for the tool. I will also be showing you how we integrate with Spira, how we can get the reporting back into Spira. Okay, and I will also warn you right now as the, the demo effect, this is a live application, things can go wrong. If things don't work, that's normal, that's test automation. Um, so we may see things not always work exactly as we want them. Uh, that will be the good old demo effect because it is live. The perils of live TV. So with that, I'm gonna move now into Rapiz over here. This is our Rapiz application. And basically, you can use Rapiz completely standalone, but it does have really nice integration with Spira. And so, for example, when you first open it up, you have this start page. We have got some built-in help and webinars that we've pre-recorded uh, that we can point you to. So if you are starting to use it for the first time, feel free to use one of the webinar links, to use the tutorials. There's inline documentation, uh, both inside Rapiz. If you F1, it will always bring up context-sensitive help. Or if you go to our Rapiz doc website, Hold on a second, go away, Zoom. Move it. There we go. Uh, the Rapiz doc website is a great uh, resource. It contains all the release notes, libraries, manuals, everything that you see is here. When you access it from within Rapiz using F1, it will also launch the site in, uh, into the right place. And we'll do that a bit later on. Okay, the other thing that I mentioned is the integration with Spira. So we have a Spira dashboard inside Rapiz. This gives you access to the test management functionality uh, inside of Rapiz natively, so you don't have to go between Rapiz here and Spira in the browser over here. You can obviously do that, but we do have it inside Rapiz. So you can look at the different projects. This is where you'll be storing all your test information. You've got graphs and charts and the ability to manage test cases and view them directly inside of Rapiz. So we have a really seamless integration between the two parts of our platform. Uh, Spira is completely web-based. Rapiz is a desktop designer tool. Okay, so enough talking. Let's go ahead and do some actual automation. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and first of all create a new test. Um, and because I'm hooked up to Spira, it is going to try and save it in Spira. You could also save it locally. So I don't want to save what I was working on. That was just something I was messing about with. So let's go ahead and save, create a new regression test. So we've got a folder called regression tests. Under that, we've got demo tests. Let's create a new folder called webinar tests. Okay, there's our webinar test, webinar test folder. I'm going to create a new test case, a uh, simple web test one for today's demonstration. And please feel free to write any questions you have in the Q&A. What, what I'll do is I'll go through the basic uh, web test and desktop test. I'll show the integration with Spira, and then I'll be coming to the Q&A. Okay, we've created a simple test. And now I've got the option of what kind of test is it. Now, although I said I gave it the name web, the system doesn't know it's web, so I need to tell it that it's web. If you choose web, it's going to load the browser the browser libraries. If you choose mobile, it loads in the, the, the mobile libraries. If you choose desktop, it's going to give you the option to pick the different libraries for the kind of application. Uh, and then there's also option for manual. Manual is a bit out of scope for today's demonstration. Manual lets, is a useful utility where Rapiz, instead of creating automated scripts, it can create manual scripts. That's useful if you've got an application that really is not a good candidate for test automation for whatever reason. Maybe the technology is not supported or maybe it's just too complicated and not, not stable enough yet. Uh, manual would let you record a manual script and it builds out the test case with the screenshots and images and uh, text as you're clicking through it. So it's kind of like a, a test documentation tool or a test manual test case creation tool so there's a useful reason for that but that's what manual is so that's not typically used in automated projects but it's a useful uh, way of using rapees to do something different and if it's interested in that i can even show that in another demo on another time all right but let's start with web I'm going to be recording in Chrome and I'll be playing it back in Chrome and, and Firefox. So we'll do Selenium Chrome. Um, the different browser libraries are all here. We support all the major browsers libraries using Selenium. Okay. And, in, and inside of Rapiz, you can customize using the Selenium Profile Manager, the different type, different profiles. So if you've got a local Chrome versus Selenium Grid on a remote network or a you know, browser stack, each one has its own profile that you can then point to. And you can change in this drop down at the top right that you see, you can change which particular browser you're playing back or recording for, through. 
But anyway, we'll come back to that in a minute. The last choice you have is, am I going to be using the codeless interface or the JavaScript code based? If you use codeless, which is what I'll do today, you can still use JavaScript for writing, for writing functions and exposing it to the codeless interface. Um, so that's the most flexible. JavaScript means it's all going to be in code. So let's go ahead and do codeless. So we have right here a very simple empty test. There's a set of, uh, as a grid, a set of steps that will be created there as we do our recording. On the left-hand side is the file explorer. Uh, that's not so useful. I actually want to switch to the object tree. That's going to give me access to all the objects that I record. And an object in this context will be a UI element, button, grid, list, table, drop down, that kind of thing. Uh, if it's an API test, it would be an API endpoint. Um, but notice that there's also these global objects that you see here. These are global utility objects that don't require prior recording. These are available right away. These are useful if you wanted to, for example, read data from a database, read things from a file. We've got the ability to you know, extract things from a PDF and so on, and write to and from files. There's some utility objects here where you can kill processes, launch an application if it's a desktop app. You can do uh, things like waiting for certain amounts of time. A lot of good utility functions are there. We've got a spreadsheet editor built in, so we can extract data from a spreadsheet for test data. Uh, we've also got some some testing functions if you want to do uh, assertions. This will be done automatically when we actually verify things using the record module, but you can always add your own assertions later. And there's also options for manipulating text, um, interacting with Spira if you want to create defects programmatically when a test fails. And there's some also test data generation tools and other tools specific to, to browsers or mobile. If you're using a browser test, you'll get Navigator. That's a browser utility. If we're using... Um, mobile, we would have a mobile utility where you can do things like simulate shaking of the phone. So there's lots of really neat functions available here in the global objects. They're all in the documentation. To, to get more information, you could just click on it, expand it, choose the option here F1, and it brings up the context sensitive help. And you can now see exactly what that function does. Okay. That's a little overview of what you're seeing. Let's go ahead and do the recording. So let's go ahead and record a simple test. I've got Selenium Chrome set up. And I'm going to be testing this sample application that we call Library Information System. When you record using Chrome, it, sh it should launch a new separate browser window that's being automated. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. So it's going to fire up Chrome. All right. And we put there's the URL to start recording. It knows that URL because I did that the last time. Uh, you enter the URL right here, and that's what will work the URL you'll be recording at. OK, OK, this is my application. I'm just going to maximize it. Now, before I do anything, let me explain what you're seeing. On the main screen, you're seeing, obviously, the browser window. On the bottom right, you're seeing the recorder. This is going to record my interactions. There's two main modes we have within Rupees. There's recording and there's learning. So for simple test automation scenarios where you're basically logging in, going to do something simple, create some data, verify it, something that a business user is going to do, um, you can use recording. It's really good for those kind of simple scenarios. For anyone who's done a lot of test automation, uh, you may know that obviously over time, when you're doing a lot of complex scenarios, recording is not always the best approach. You want to build more of a framework, make it more reusable, maintainable. To do that, you'll use the learn option instead. Learn object lets you grab objects and put them into your object repository, and then you can build the test that way. I'll show you both options, but let's just start with the recording. So let's go ahead and log in. And I notice it's going to be recording my actions on the bottom right as I do them. It may bring up a password manager. It might not. It doesn't. That's good. Librarian. And the password is the same. This is a sample application that you can use at home. It's publicly hosted. I'm going to log in. And now I want to verify that I logged in. So I'm going to use this verify option. I usually use the keystroke because it's more convenient to move the mouse over and do control and one. So it'll pop up the verification text. Uh, you could do bitmap as well. And let's go ahead and create a book. So click on book management, create a book. And you can see down here what's going on. You can always go in here and you can edit actions if you want to change something. I don't really want to do that right now. But if you want to, you can do that. If you click on something by mistake and you want to get rid of it, you can remove irrelevant actions as well. So I'll create a new book, Adam's book. Uh, genre is historical fiction. I'm going to insert that. Let's go ahead and verify that I did that correctly with control and one. Let's do the text of that too. Text, hit OK. Let's log out, get back to my starting point. So clean up, hit finish. And that's a simple test, very easy to record. Uh, business user could do that, hit append. And now you've got a, a script. And I call it a script, but it's really a scenario because there's no, there's no code.
what you can see here is a series of actions. So anything that's a, that's an operation is typically one line. If it's an action where it's got more than one parameter, it might be more than one line. Most are usually one. Some actions like logging in and clicking are just simple click, click. When you've got some data, like entering text, you would see the object name, which is the username inbox. You'll see the action, which is to set the text. And you'll now have a parameter value, which is to put the value into that. So this is what it's recorded. Now you may wonder, and also sorry, when you verify something, it does create four lines right here. It creates the assertion, which is the message display, if it matches or doesn't match. Let me make that a little bigger. Um, you'll also see the action. That's the, it's gonna basically get the text of the librarian little text box. And it's gonna compare that output of that with the parameter and parameter two is the value that we're hoping to match it. So what this is saying is, Verify that whatever's in that box that was called librarian, which is the login name, uh, make sure the text is the word librarian. And if you wonder where these name these objects come from, they come from the left hand side. The global objects, I'm going to hide those. Under the window names, we have the actual objects that you see here. And, and although it's called librarian, it's basically appointed to the, the login, the name of the person who's logged in. So you could decide to rename that something else and make it sort of librarian. You could make it a uh, login name and then change it here. So and another thing is now how do you change the script well it's very easy it's all a series of drop downs and menus so if i wanted to for example add an item let's say i wanted to click on something that i didn't record i can go to here in the object tree expand the menu see all the operations if i don't know what they do i can click on one and do f1 like i did before i can then drag that down here to the test grid let go and now i've got a test action if i want to comment it out because it's not good i can comment it out like that I can uncomment it out like that very easily. I'll just actually let me show it commented out properly. There you go. It goes green. That means it's not going to be acted on. Let me so easy to comment things out and try them out. Uh, and, and if you want to change the operation, you can go to the drop down. So instead of cl clicking on the login, I want to double click. Maybe I want to do something else. I want to uh, make sure it's very, make sure it's visible on the screen. Maybe I want to hold the left button down, hold the left button up. You, so you can simulate different operations all available right here. If I want to choose a different object, I don't have to drag it. I could also do it from here. And this will show me every object you see in the object tree. So I can change it right there as well and then change the operation. So it's, again, it's very easy to modify the script, make changes to delete things. You can right click and do delete. So before we go any further, I'm going to play that to make sure it works and then I'm going to show you a few other things we can do but first of all let's go ahead and play that so to play that again the zoom window seems to always be right where I don't want it put back at the top um, so I'm going to go play the test and it should go back in here in Chrome and play and it's doing the playback right now hopefully you can see that Okay, that worked. We can also get screenshot capture. I will show you that when we do the Spyro test integration part, but that's how easy it is to record a simple script and play it back. And make sure you write your questions in the Q&A or the chat window. I think Q&A is preferred. If you have written in the chat, don't worry. We will answer them there too, but the Q&A is the main one. So um, again, we'll come back to the Q&A after I've gone through some of the main scenarios first, but don't worry, we will get to your questions. Uh, the next thing I want to show you before we do that, though, is how we play it back in a different browser. To do that, it's really easy. Go in here, change the browser. Make sure now you have to make sure you configure these correctly. Um, typically, you just you just install repeats and it will find the browser. Sometimes you have to point it at where your browser is installed if it's in a different location to normal. Um, I had to do that before the demo, so I want to play it back in Firefox. Let's hope let's hope that works and hit the play button, and it should now launch Firefox. Now that's Chrome, so it won't be there. It should hopefully fire up Firefox. Now I do have Firefox running, but it won't use that. It will use a separate Firefox that's uh, being controlled by the browser, by the repeat, sorry. And um, that's one thing to note. Most of the browsers nowadays, for security reasons, when they're being controlled by a tool like um, repeat, they do display that in a, in a certain way. Like in Firefox, you'll see you've got this pinky, orangey, salmon-y color URL bar with a little robot icon. That means it's it's telling you that it's being controlled by a third-party app. 
And in Chrome, it will do the same thing. It says Chrome is being controlled by automated test software. So that's really important. So it doesn't, it plays back in a dedicated window and that's for security reasons. Um, all the major browsers are now basically forcing that model. Okay, so that's how we would play back the same test on two different browsers. And if you wanted to play it back on multiple browsers, you can use Spyrotest to send different test parameters through. But before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about how we would save that to Spyrotest and have it run from a test management tool and get that, that beautiful reporting and screenshots, because that's a nice thing to have. So what I did is I ran this test on two different browsers and I ran it completely locally uh, by hitting the play button. That's great when you're writing tests, but typically what you want to do is have them be stored somewhere and then you're going to execute them uh, overnight and come back and they're all finished and have control over that. And also, you know, when this test passes or fails, have a permanent record of that from an audit standpoint. So to do that, what you'll need to do is, first of all, save it back to Spira. So I'm saving this to Spira. And it's going to upload it to Spira. Spira acts as the document repository. It can either store it in its native document repository or it can use an integrated Git repo. That's really up to you. Um, in either model, Spira will act as the version control system for repeats. And if I now go over here into my Firefox, this is now back in my native real Firefox window. Uh, this is where Spire is running. If I go into the project I was working on, which was a library information system, if I go in here and I choose the uh, test case section, you will see that down here we have a new folder, hopefully, called webinar test under regression. So let's go into the root. I'm going to go into regression, into webinar. And there's my webinar test I just created. If I click on it, you will see that inside of Spyro, we have the name of the test. There's no description. There's no steps because it's not a manual test. If you want to have steps that it was based on, you could do those here. And then down here is the automation section. And that points to a location inside of Spyro where we're storing the test information. Now, if you wanted to parameterize this test and have Spyro pass through like the browser name so you can run on different browsers or different test data, you can do that here. You define the input parameters right here then Respira will populate those and they get passed to repeats as input parameters. And that's one again, another really nice feature of using it with Spira. You can also call repeats from the command line or uh, Jenkins or ADO or any other pipeline that you might be using and do something very similar as well. All right, let's go ahead though and talk about the scheduling. So let's go ahead and run that test that we just created. Uh, let's go to test sets. And as I said, this is not a Spira test demonstration or webinar, so I'm not going to spend too much time on Spira. If you want to see that, the, there's a webinar coming up, I think, in a week or two's time. But let's go ahead and create a simple test set just to run it. So with a simple automation script. And in real life, I probably want to have more than one test in a suite that I'm running. Uh, I'm just doing one right now. So let's go ahead in here and let's go ahead and have Spire run this automatically. So I go into test cases. I grab my test case from my webinar folder. I only have the one, hit save, and choose the release. I'm gonna run it on release one of my library information system. I, want, I choose the machines. My machine's called TARDIS because I'm a Doctor Who fan. And if you go into the um, plan date, I want to run it right now. There is the option to run it based on a build. If you do that, it's gonna be triggered by a pipeline like Jenkins or GitLab, GitLab or GitHub or something like that. So we have that option as well. So I've scheduled my test. It's ready to go. Uh, what needs to happen next? The last thing I'll do is I am going to close down repeats because we don't need that. We have a special launching tool. And one of the things that's important is that our launching tool, which we call repeats launcher, is completely free. So if you uh, are using Spira with repeats, you don't need to buy execution licenses like some of our competitors. You can just simply use the free repeats launcher and it will run the test um, automatically for you uh, and doesn't require a license. So we only charge for the editing tool, which is the tool that we use to write the tests. So it's just found my test. It's going to start running it and it should hopefully run it over here in Chrome if I've got it right. So um, let's see what happens. And it will look very similar to the last time. It's just going to run it in Chrome. Hopefully you can see that okay. So to the outward user, it looks identical to last time. The difference is now it is being run remotely from Spira, and it will report back to Spira, which it didn't do the last time. All right, that's finished. I'm going to close my, my, my browser windows down that I'm using for running the test. 
I'm going to close launcher down altogether because we don't need that anymore for at least for today's demo. So close that. Exit out, of, exit out of it. And I'm going to Spire, hit the refresh button and you'll see it's completed, it's passed. If we go to the test run section, we'll see a new test run. And you can see right here in Spire, we've got the results, screenshots, and embedded steps. So you can see exactly what happened with screenshots click by click. And that this, in this case, the test passed. That's also going to then show up in the graphs and charts. If you go into the test run section, you would see on the left hand side this little miniature graph that shows you all the runs. If you go into the reporting section, you've got a lot more graphs and charts where you can see the results over time, what's going on. Now, obviously, this is a demo system. We're not doing a ton of um, testing. It's for demos, so it won't show too much data, but you can see, yeah, there's the pass from today. If we go to test run progress, you'll see probably today's run. Uh, if I do that this week, update or maybe this month anyways you'll see the different runs in here oh there we go perfect so there you can see the different runs that we've been doing for the demos okay so that's some of the benefits of using it with spyro now if we go back into the repeats itself let's talk about some of the other features that we haven't yet gone through first of all before we move into desktop apps let's finish up web apps so i've shown you how you can record a simple test uh, in this case, I was just recording a creating of a book, but I might want to be testing the application and I might want to do a lot more changes. I might not want to record every single thing by using record and play. I might want to edit my test and just build it myself. So how would I do that? So if I go back to the RBL view, let's say I want to add some additional actions so I can just drag and drop these objects. But how do I get these objects in the first place? What you'll do though is use record and it's going to fire up uh, Chrome again. So I probably shouldn't have closed it, but that's okay. There we go. It's going to bring up the URL. Yep. OK, great. And instead of now recording, I'm going to use the learn option, control and two. When I use control and two, it's a way to quickly grab objects from the page. I'm just doing it by hovering the mouse. As you can see, it's really, really quick, much faster than recording. And I've got all my objects learned. Hit finish. Go back to repeats. And if I go append, there's actually no script, so nothing really needs to be there. I'll just get rid of that. That was opening the browser up. We don't need that. And if you go to the left-hand side there, you'll see we've got a whole bunch more objects than we had a minute ago. And if I want to now click on the repeats icon, I can just go in here and go click. I want to click on the inflector icon, you know, click. So now I can build my test this way. I don't have to record anything. I can just learn objects. I can then interact with them using the, the left-hand side objects and putting them into the test grid. So that's how you would build a scenario using the codeless interface. How do we do things like data-driven testing? Now, that's easy as well because we have a table editor. Now, what you can do is you would typically, the easiest way is to create what's called a map. So if we go in here, we'll create a map. And our codeless interface lets you create both um, loops and branches without any code. So let's create this new map. And we'll call it a row map. You can do a column map as well. And let's imagine we're going to basically run the same test through multiple books and multiple um, logins. So we'll call it users and books. And, and just do a couple of examples. So we'll have the login name, the password, and we'll have the book name. Now you could do the author as well, the genre of the author, whatever else you need. I'm just going to get rid of these additional columns I don't need. And this test there doesn't have to be embedded here. It could be in a separate sheet. It can be an external spreadsheet. It can be a database. It can be a web service. There's lots of different places we can get the data from. I'll just do admin. Librarian. Borrower. Um, uh, maybe the password is, you know, password one, two, three. Hopefully it's not for the admin. Change me. And I don't know, borrower. And the book name might be, I'm just, my brain is not in a creative mode. So I'm just going to do book one, two, book three like that, but you get the idea. And now if I wanted to then loop my test through, I pick the section of the test I want to iterate, which is this section here. And I say, wrap the section in a loop. I say, use my map. I've only got one map, but it could be more than one. And that's not quite it. The last step is I have to remap these fixed strings to the variables. So it's easy enough. You go in here, you change it from string to the map and change that to login. Same thing here with password. And the same thing with book name. And you do it in the verify as well, which I haven't done. So again, imagine I did that. So, and the Zoom window is yet again in the way. So let's move it out. The way. <laughs> there we go. And like that. So now I've taken my hard-coded test 
in, and made it a data driven test. And that took about maybe you know one minute, 30 seconds a minute. Very easy to do. So that's how you would do things like data driven testing completely codeless. There's also the option to wrap things in if then statements. If you want to do branching conditions, you can do that here. Very easy. Uh, and if you want to play a section, you can do it right here as well. So if I want to just play the login sequence, because sometimes when you're doing testing, I want to log in and then learn more objects. Well, I'm lazy. I don't want to have to, to log in by hand. That's a lot of work. I could just go in here and literally go right click, you know, play this section. It logs me in and I can do my recording. So it's very useful from a, just from a productivity standpoint. Now, but you might be thinking like, well, that's great, but I'm a programmer. I like to, I, I, I don't want to do if thens in, in this table. Um, I want to do it in code. How would I do that? Very easy. Um, you can write functions directly in JavaScript. You can go to the user file, and that's always available. You write your functions here. But if you want to take something you've already learned in Codeless and convert it to code, you can do that as well. All you need to do is to go right click, copy selection as JavaScript, and you just paste it in, and it's now converted it into JavaScript. We don't need that first line. And if you want to then use JavaScript, you can still do the same thing and drag things from here. From, from the side. So you can drag things from the left-hand side, whether it's codeless or code. And we have a the advantage of code is we do have a debugger as well. So if you want to do more advanced debugging, you can, you can wrap put things in code. And then if you want to then have this be executed, all you do is you wrap it with a containing function. So let's say this is the login function, login to system. And you can then uh, pass the parameters. So you'd have like login password because you see those are defined here so you need to make those input parameters because otherwise it's going to complain that those aren't defined you save that once it's saved you can then call it from within the um the function so you go to action and you would go to functions where are the fun f for functions function function oh no generator sorry functions and then under there you would see the login to system hit enter and now you've got your login which you can then pass from the map. Now, I'm not inside the loop, but if I was inside the loop, I could then pass that from the variables, just like I was doing. So you, now you're combining code and low and no code. So you're getting basically sort of a low code. So the great thing is from a collaboration standpoint, if you've got team members that are business users uh, and you've got team members who are, who are more technical, they can work on the same test. The technical users can write things in functions like this, and the business users can just call those functions and pass test data. So it really allows a lot of collaboration between different skill levels on the same team. Okay, so that's how you would do some of the data-driven testing. Um, before we move on to desktop apps, and I know we're running short of time, uh, but what about um, more complex web apps? I've shown how you record and learn, and you would say, well, I've got a complex app. It's, 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 it's got like a big grid, and it's got a very complex DOM. How do I interact with that? Because if I click learn, it might learn the wrong thing. So there, is some, there are more advanced tools. If I go back into uh, record, wait to finish. Once it comes up, uh, you've got the spy tools. So the spy tool lets you basically interact. I think this is, let me make sure this is live. So you can learn by just doing control and two. Yep, that learns that. But that's okay for this. But suppose I want to look at a grid. So let me log in. I'm going to pause the recorder so I can log in myself. So you can see if you want to pause recording, you can always do that. Easy and easy. Uh, OK, if I want to look at this grid, hit resume. Now, I can then use the spy, and the spy will let me see what's behind the grid. So I can go in here, and it loads the grid. And I can do Control-T for tracking. Let's say I want to look at this, I want to look at this, this link. It's really useful. I can do Control-T. It's now taking me into the app. I can see the DOM. And now if I want to learn this web object, I can double click on it. It shows me the X path of how it finds it. And that's also where some of the intelligence comes in. Repeats has different options for learning X path. And when it learns it and doing recording, you might want to, want to wonder, why does it use this kind of X path, not a different kind? Well, there's different rules built into Rupees, which lets it understand how to find a web app, how to, sorry, how to find objects in the web app. And you can actually configure and train Rupees to actually learn the objects in different ways. So if you know that in your application, the ID is always um, transient and every time you refresh the page, it changes, and that's a useless way to learn the, URL, the link, then you could 
train rupees to ignore that particular ID. Now, in this case, it actually is a great way of learning it because that ID is the business ID of a book. So if I'm learning that link, it would actually be the right link every time. So it's actually very valid, but it isn't always. And so rupees can, can be adjusted to learn the objects in different ways that match your application. And that helps it be more resilient. But that's a bit, a bit more of an advanced topic that we're not going to go into too much today. But if I wanted to learn this object that I've now found in the in the, in the spy tool, I can learn the, ob the object by hitting learn. And now it gets added to my my um, learn window. And if I go to finish and go back to repeat, it does exactly what it did before. And it allows me to add that to the object so if I, page. So if I go here, you'll see under the book management window, we've got this new edit link. And that is the link that I just found using the spy. So to recap, you can record and play. You can learn objects by just moving the mouse over and learning them. Or you can... Um, use the spy tools to go more deep into the application. And that's comp useful for more tricky, complex apps. We do have spy tools for all of the different uh, technologies. That was the web spy. We also have it for desktop and mobile and Java flavor of, of desktop as well. So that's an overview of web applications. I'm now going to show you a little bit of desktop. Now, we don't have a ton of time, and I want to get to questions, so I'm not going to do as much in desktop. I'll just show you the basics of how similar it is with a desktop app. And again, with a mobile app, it's also very similar. You have a little picture appears in repeats with the phone, and you can record and play, and it learns objects. So desktop, web, mobile, all similar concepts. The locators and the technologies are different, but the UI and how you do all the testing and playing it back is identical. Okay, so let's do a quick desktop app. To do that, I'm going to create a new test. I'll put it into my regression folder under webinars. Uh, this one we're going to call new test case. We'll call it simple. Everything's simple, I guess. It's a, it's a webinar. Simple uh, desktop app. Hit OK. Desktop now. So I choose desktop this time, not web. All right. Uh, we'll use RVL for a visual language. And now I'm going to record. Now, this is my desktop app, and it truly is very simple. It's a, it's called Two Dialogues. It's a free sample that comes with rupees. And I'm going to go record. So ignore Chrome in the background. We're not using that. OK. Uh, let me find my app. It's the Two Dialogues. There it is. Notice with, with, now with desktop, there's a little more options. I'm going to use automatic. But if you go to libraries, there are different options here. If, so if you know you're using, for example, um, Microsoft Dynamics, and that's a desktop app, you can't just use the regular desktop libraries you should all well you should but you can but you shouldn't you should also use the ax libraries it, uh, same thing with see with nav so make sure uh, and so on and so forth and same for these uh if you're doing like swt or if you're going to do we use one of these third party libraries like infragistics or sync fusion if you're doing java make sure you add the java if you're doing oracle forms that oracle forms so there are different libraries that you need to enable for different desktop technologies and it may require a little bit of playing around to get the right one if you're not sure our support team is always here to help you with with their recommendations this particular application is a very straightforward desktop app, so I don't need all of that. So the, I'll just choose automatic. It's now recording, and I'm going to now interact with this application. I'm going to click on it, and I'm going to enter my name, Adam, and enter someone else's name, Teresa. And I'm going to say, OK, and I'm going to verify the output. Thank you, your name is Adam. Okay, okay, hit finish. And it finishes, append. I've got the exact same thing I had before. I've got a script and objects. It looks identical, except if I was to go a little bit deeper, there's no X path anymore. It's using a different set of location technologies. The objects and the parameters, the functions like the do set text, the um, commands you can do are a little bit different, but conceptually it's very similar. You can do everything I did before. You can create maps, you can create loops, you can do branching, you can use code, you can use low code. Uh, you can save it to Spyro, you can run it from Spyro, you can do reporting with screenshots. Everything else, apart from the fact that this desktop is the same, and the same thing is true with mobile. So it's really easy to use for all these different platforms. It's one skill set you need to do it. Uh, and again, if you wanted to find an object on the page, make sure it's there. You can do the same thing we would have done on web, which is to use Flash. So I'm just going to hopefully, it'll, if I do that, bring that there and Flash and then bring that, yeah. It should then flash the object, hopefully, and pop up. There you go. So that way, it, it'll verify the objects on the page. And if you ever change your application, whether it's mobile or web or desktop, you can just do relearn, and that lets you remap the object. 